Okay, so on top of this um, rock, ice, and for at least Saturn and Jupiter, metallic hydrogen, we have our planetary atmospheres. So on top of um, each of these worlds is a layer of molecular hydrogen. So by molecular hydrogen, I mean those hydrogen um, hydrogens that are bonded with another hydrogen atom. So that's H2. And so this hydrogen gas is the primary component of all of the Jovian atmospheres, um, but that doesn't mean it's the only component. There are other gases also within. If we look at the percentage of each planet's volume by how much is in each layer, remember we were just looking at slices of a long constant radius. So the atmospheres of the Jovians are definitely their thickest part, right? So 42% of Jupiter is atmosphere with about almost 60% metallic hydrogen. Saturn has almost 87, 90% atmosphere. And on Uranus and Neptune as well, most of their volume lives in the atmosphere and their rocky and icy cores are fairly small by comparison. Um, these are organized by density again. So the atmospheric hydrogen is the least dense material. Metallic hydrogen is more dense, but not as dense as ices of ammonia and methane. And then the rock is the most dense of all. So again, we see that the process of differentiation has organized the um, gas giants. And when we look at all these together, this is where the average density of the planets comes from. So each layer is definitely a very different density with the upper levels of the atmosphere being very thin and the rocky cores being quite dense. Um, but on average, they work out to being a little bit more dense than water for all these except Saturn. All right, so the same process basically plays out for all of the planets, this process of differentiation. So thinking back to our terrestrial worlds and their primary atmospheres, what was the main component of the terrestrial primary atmospheres? Okay, yeah, so hydrogen and helium were actually the largest components of the primary atmospheres with hydrogen being about 94% of it, helium about almost 6% and everything else being trace gases. So this, remember the secondary atmospheres contained mostly water and carbon dioxide. And then the, the tertiary atmospheres, the atmospheres we have today are a little bit different depending on where you are. Okay, but the primary atmospheres were the same for all the terrestrial worlds. And when we look at the composition of the atmospheres for the Jovians, um, they are fairly similar to these primary atmospheres. So essentially, Jovians kept their primary atmospheres. On terrestrial planets, those primary atmospheres escaped over time, but not so on the gas giants. So why would this be the case? Why did they keep their primary atmospheres? All right. So I'm seeing various parts of the, of the correct answer here in your votes. So definitely their large mass is helpful. When we think about why any planet keeps an atmosphere, it's because it has a strong enough gravity so that the um, average molecular speed is not six times greater than the escape velocity of that planet. So a lower escape velocity happens for a lower mass and therefore a large mass, stronger gravity, more likely to keep its primary atmosphere. But mass is not the only important factor here. Temperature is also really important. So the um, hotter a gas is, the faster its average speed will be, and the more likely it will be to escape. And therefore, the colder a planet is, the more likely the gases are to stick around and stay in the atmosphere. And so therefore, um, both the mass and the cold nature of these planets are important. So their equilibrium temperatures are low because they're very far from the sun. Um, the large radius would increase the probability that a gas would escape. Um, I didn't expect you to necessarily think of this, but in our escape velocity formula, the radius is in the denominator. So larger radius would make for a lower escape speed. And for that reason, um, five is also not quite accurate. You want 
large mass and you want cold, but you don't necessarily want large radius. All right, so when we actually calculate the escape velocities of all these different planets um, and compare them to the average speeds of hydrogen and helium, then we can see, you know, using our rule of six, multiplying the average speeds by six, um, none of those will exceed even close the escape velocities of the gas giants. These escape velocities are just huge because these planets are so massive. Remember Earth's was 11.2 kilometers per second. So even Uranus is about um, twice the escape velocity of Earth. Okay, we're happy for now. So um, I wanna ask why do the gas giants have different appearances? if they have very similar atmospheric compositions. And this has to do not with the hydrogen and helium, those are, well, colorless gases, but instead with the trace gases present in their atmospheres. So Jupiter has trace amounts of methane and ammonia. Remember, these are the same gases that are squished into a solid ice at the core, well, just outside the rocky cores of these worlds. Um, but the methane and ammonia are present in different amounts on each planet, and that's what leads to their different appearances. So let's go ahead and walk through this a little bit. On Jupiter and Saturn, the ammonia constitutes most of the clouds. And so these frozen ammonia clouds in the upper atmosphere are the reason that we see sort of, you know, tannish um, and rusty red and brown colors. Um, in contrast, Uranus and Neptune are both blue. And that is because their clouds are made of frozen methane, which scatters blue light and so appears blue. Um, the specific colors in Jupiter's banding are caused by chemical reactions that happen in its upper atmosphere as ultraviolet light from the sun interacts with the molecules of methane and ammonia. So that is the general reason behind the appearance of these. Um, methane, by the way, is the gas present in like farts, for lack of a better word. Um, so methane, if we went to these planets, if it were a gas, it would smell stinky like rotten eggs. Okay, um, so the temperature of the cloud layers is listed here. So it's um, fairly low, right? Quite low compared to the around 250, 300 Kelvin that we're used to in the terrestrial worlds. Um, and it just decreases for the most part as we get farther from the sun. But notice that there are some exceptions. So there are some effects caused by atmosphere and also by the presence of internal heating that causes the temperature of the cloud layers not to be uniformly dropping off as we go to the outer reaches of the solar system. But the temperature also influences the color because different gases have different freezing points. So for example, methane freezes at 91 degrees Kelvin. Um, the temperature at the surface of Neptune and Uranus is 52 Kelvin. So since it's lower, methane is able to freeze there. But methane cannot freeze on Jupiter and Saturn because it's too warm. And so if it were a bit colder on Jupiter and Saturn, um, at or below 91 Kelvin, then they would have a blue appearance as well. Okay. When we look at the atmospheres, we can also measure the rotation speed. Um, and what we find is that the rotation period is measured in just hours for all of these gas giants. Remember the rotation period of Earth is 24 hours. So it may be surprising, but Jupiter is actually rotating at, it makes one full rotation every 10 hours. So it's whipping around pretty fast for such a large body. And the rotation speed um, is such that the outer portions of the atmosphere move at 28,000 miles per hour on Jupiter. So lots of fast moving gases, and that leads to a lot of um, storms. So let's talk about how we get this banded storm pattern on Jupiter. There's a couple ideas that we'll have to put together to understand Jupiter's storms. And the first one is convection. So in convection, if you have some heated patch of air 
in an atmosphere. It rises. Um, as it rises, it cools and increases in volume. As that air then is cool, it can sink back down where it heats again. So the process of convection leads to a circulation of air within an atmosphere. And so this is important because it leads to mixing. Um, and then these convection cells that get set up um, as hot air convects upward, um, they stretch around the planet due to their fast rotation. So imagine these convection cells of cool air above warm air getting wrapped all the way around the planet. And that is basically a picture of Jovian storms. So convection plus rapid rotation together, they set up this, what we call zonal flow, where there are different wind speeds uh, in different bands along the surface. So you can imagine that um, if I was going to draw the convection cells on Jupiter, the air would be rising toward you out of the screen, and then it would be cooling toward the north and the south of wherever it rose up. So for example, if the hot air were rising in this white region, then it would be sinking above and below. So the winds do not all um, point in the same direction, they depend on the band. So you can see in this band, this dark band of Jupiter here, the wind is actually flowing backwards compared to the region just above and just below it. All right, the zonal flow is a lot different on Jupiter and Saturn. You'll notice there's a lot more sort of difference in wind speed versus latitude compared to Uranus and Neptune. And there's a good reason for that. So we'll get to that in a second. Okay. So question for you. I told you how fast the atmospheres rotate on these planets. How do you suppose we measure such a thing? All right. The answer is actually quite simple. Uh, I see 50-50 split between choice number one and choice number four. So the simple solution is you simply track a feature on its surface. So looking at Jupiter, for example, you could watch the great red spot and see how long that takes to go around the entire planet. And thus you would know how fast that part of the atmosphere rotates. Um, you probably remember from your reading that we do in fact measure the variation in radio signals from the planet's interior, um, but that helps us measure the rotation of the interior, not the rotation of the surface. And that might sound a little weird because on Earth, the rotation of the surface is the same as the rotation speed of the interior because it's a solid body, right? Um, but on the gas giants, that's not the case. Different parts of the atmosphere rotate at different rates and the interior rotates at a different speed entirely. So here's an example of what our zonal flow pattern looks like on Jupiter. You can see that not only do different bands move at different speeds, but they're actually even moving in different directions. Um, you can also see how the great red spot is a cyclone. And um, some of these small ovals are thought to be cyclones as well. Some of them are called cyclones or anti-cyclones, depending on their direction. Um, this was from Voyager 1, which some of you did your uh, planet exploration project on. So I think this is like the coolest GIF. All right. so. The interior is what we measure with radio signals. And this was kind of discovered by accident. So some astronomers had made a radio array in, um, gosh, I think this was New Jersey to measure the Crab Nebula. And uh, which is a, I won't get into it. It's a different feature. It's part of our galaxy, but it's not within our solar system. And instead, they found an interference signal that was getting in the way of their data that occurred about four minutes earlier every night over several months. And so they realized that because of the way it was moving on the sky, it was actually Jupiter. Um, so there were natural radio emissions from Jupiter that were noise for these researchers. Um, but that discovery allowed us to start studying these radio signals. Um, I'm going to show you a very complicated set of graphs, but 
don't worry about what they mean entirely. But what to notice is that there are these um, dark stripes on the radio plots and the timing between these plots, the timing between these strong signals tells us how fast the interior is rotating. So the idea is that if the center of, the, of Jupiter is creating radio signals, and that is for whatever reason stronger at one point in its rotation, then you're seeing that point periodically every time the interior rotates. And so based on how often you see that, it's the same as watching for how long the great red spot comes around again, except you're doing it with radio this time. So they were able to find that the interior rotation of Jupiter is about 10 hours. All right. Oh, also fun in this picture that um, you can see these blue markings on the north and south poles of Jupiter. Um, those are Jupiter's aurora. Okay. So the storms on Jupiter are called the, well, spots. So we've got our great red spot. This is a high pressure system and it's been stable for hundreds of years. Um, it's dissipating slowly over time. And then we've got the white ovals. These are smaller high pressure systems and they seem to be stable over about decades. They can merge with each other and they can even merge into the great red spot. Um, similar but different systems happen on Saturn. They're a lot harder to see because there's <clears throat> less of a, a color variation on Saturn's surface. But if you color them in false color by their pressure, then you can see some fun patterns such as this storm, um, which wrapped all the way around Saturn and then ate its own tail and destroyed itself. Saturn also has a really unique feature. Um, at its northern pole, it has a vortex that's shaped like a hexagon. So again, this is a false color image. Um, when we look at storms on Neptune, it used to have a dark spot that was spotted by Voyager 2, but since that time it has disappeared. Um, there might be new spots on Neptune. I see glimmerings in the news about those every now and then. So the storms on Neptune are less stable than the ones on Jupiter. Um, you can also see clouds, wispy serious clouds of methane on Neptune. So all of this weather has to be driven by heat, right? The convection cells cannot get set up without some source of interior heat. And the sources of heat are different for each of the planets. Um, for Jupiter, the, the heat is from what we call primordial heat, which is that gravity is still slowly compressing the entire planet. And that energy from compression heats the interior. Um, for Saturn, the helium in its outer atmosphere is raining down toward its interior and that generates heat. Um, and then for Neptune and Uranus, Neptune doesn't have a heat source and Uranus has a small heat source, but we don't really understand what it's from. So the outer worlds, these ice giants, Neptune and Uranus, they are the least explored. They're really far away. They're hard to send probes to. And so for that reason, there's a lot of mysteries about these worlds that we still have not uncovered. <clears throat> 